by him. His palace is surrounded by all the machinery of a modern administration, but even his prime minister brings the important decisions back to him. In his old age, it looks as if Haile Selassie has routed all his enemies at last, to emerge supreme, as if the all-wise and benevolent Lion of Judah has prevailed. Yet the one thing Haile Selassie has not prevailed over is his own country. Outside Addis Ababa, the traditional Ethiopian ways have hardly changed at all. The emperor's writ runs only as far as his governors can ride. Sometimes that may not be far enough. Less than a third of Haile Selassie's people live within a day's ride of any sort of road. It's over 60 years since Haile Selassie in his youth started his career as governor for the Emperor Menelik in this very province. And the system's no different for the man who represents him now. Every time the governor rides out into the farther reaches of his province, he gets a royal welcome. Like Haile Selassie in the old days, the governor still needs guards to protect him, servants to tend him, even interpreters to translate for him, because hardly anybody in the remoter provinces speaks the language of the emperor's government. It's government in the medieval style and modern Addis Ababa seems very far away. Even the bigger villages eye for an island village. where all the men of the community are summoned by the Emperor's Commissioner to uncover a criminal. It's the village elders who make the investigation. If they can't agree on a culprit, every man present will suffer his share of a collective punishment. If the finger points to one man, he can expect short shrift. In every village marketplace, the public gallows still waits for the murderer or the rebel. But what's law for the poor in Haile Selassie's empire is less often law for the rich. The Ethiopian parliament is the emperor's own creation, a little nudge of his people towards constitutional government but it's twice refused to pass the emperor's own land reform law because its members won't give away their own privileges. As the years go by, the emperor's step gets slower. He may live in some splendor himself, but he knows the Ethiopian peasant is still as poor as any in Africa. Yet he's paralyzed by the traditions he's inherited from 2,000 years ago. Landlords and princes dominate his parliament and hold the countryside in fee. The peasants own nothing. And at harvest time, the landlords and their bailiffs come to demand their share of the crop. The landlords may not be as powerful as they used to be, but like the barons of feudal England, they're still strong enough sometimes to hold even the monarch at bay. Still strong enough to hold the people in complete subservience. Biggest of all the landlords is the Ethiopian church. History has made it inseparable from the empire, and now, as powerful as the great monastic orders of medieval Europe, it dominates the life of the Christian highlands. The church is the cross that is also the nation's salvation.
both a reactionary burden and a civilizing influence. Its priests may be ignorant, but they're usually the only people for miles around who can read or write. Its schools are pathetic, but until Haile Selassie's reign, few other schools existed. 90% of his people remain totally illiterate. Nearly half the population of Ethiopia now is under the age of 15. And for Haile Selassie, their education has always been an obsession. He's taken personal charge of the Ministry of Education, sought teachers and money for more schools from half the countries in the world, and turned one of his palaces into a university. He's directly responsible for whatever schooling these youngsters get. But like everywhere else, the more they have, the more they want. School strikes and revolutionary slogans take command. And Haile Selassie's efforts are dismissed by the young as mere failure and repression. The educated middle-aged are rebellious too. They owe their privileges to the emperor as much as to anyone, but they whisper their discontent in the posh bars of Addis every night and can't wait for the old man to go. But the old man's still there, as shrewd and ruthless as ever. He still knows how to balance one force against another, playing off traditional resentments against novel discontents. Some of the latest challengers to Haile Selassie's rule combine the old and the new Ethiopian divisions and discontents. Down near the coast in Eritrea, where the Italians had their empire for half a century, there's a popular liberation front now, fighting for independence from Haile Selassie and joining the old battle of Islam against Christianity with a new revolutionary movement against an ancient monarchy. The emperor can send his army to deal with that. But it hasn't always been easy for him to deal with his army. His soldiers now are a far cry from the barefoot rabble that Mussolini's men destroyed nearly 40 years ago and farther still from the medieval cavalry that won him his crown 20 years before that. But only 10 years ago, some of his soldiers tried to throw him out and very nearly succeeded. It could happen again, the classic 20th century military coup d'etat against an aging ruler. Haile Selassie is a lonely man now. His wife, two sons, a daughter are all dead, and though others remain to keep him company now and then, the essential solitude of his life on the tightrope of power must grow more oppressive every year. On one side, there's still the old Ethiopian world of feudal power and tradition. On the other, there's the new challenge of his own reforms, the educated youngsters and the modern army officers who want the world and would like it now. They're the upper and nether millstones which have ground many a good man exceeding small, especially in this century. To have survived them for the better part of 55 years in power is something unequaled by any ruler in the world today. No wonder the Lion of Judah has become one of the living legends of our time.